Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for waking up early to come to this workshop. Um, how many of you were in Nathan's workshop before this? Okay, this just gives me a sense of who's in the room. Um, and how many of you are run your own agency? Like have employees? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you are freelancers or solo folks? Work on your own? All right. And how many of you have a boss? Okay. <laughs> we all have a boss, somewhere or other. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> all right. Um, let me think. Why did you choose to come to this workshop? What's, what are you hoping for? Because I have lots of things I can talk about, but let me make sure that I'm talking about what you need to hear. Any special requests or things that you want to make sure we mention? Yes? I'm here for techniques. Techniques. Okay. Techniques I have. Yes? Well, I think they might want to hear what you're saying. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm working on like a project manager, and I want to install some mindfulness techniques into the work process, so that I would know how to um, maybe help relax some of my uh, colleagues when they have uh, tough uh, okay. situations. Okay. Yeah. Other requests? Yes. I have to read. Uh, for me, it's uh, steps to take to get there. Like little what to do, what to try. Okay. If it works. So lots Some of tactics, strategies. Could be, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great, thank you. Other requests, things that you'd like us to talk about? today? Yes, maybe how to um, incorporate mindfulness uh, effectively because, for example, I have tried to, um, I have tried meditation, uh, but then I get, I don't find the time or I get tired of it or I just uh, don't do it anymore. Then I try again, I fail again and so forth. So how to make this work uh, so I feel better. Okay. I'll come to you in just a second, yes. I know that you work uh, a bit with uh, entrepreneurs, so uh, I would love to know some uh, techniques that are more adapted to for this particular situation. Okay. As an, uh, how you deal with uh, uh, mental health as an entrepreneur? Okay, we can do that. This is helpful to me, by the way, so that I can kind of use our time well. So, uh it should be important. I have tried a lot of meditation, but kind of when I'm uh, on a physical pain, I try it, but uh, my mind gets much more focused on the physical pain, and kind of it hurts much more. Okay. <laughs> so we okay. go to know how to focus not on the pain. Okay. So it sounds like there. Most folks are here for some tactics and problem solving. Is that what I'm hearing? Like specific strategies for <coughs> things that you can try to optimize mental health. And then we'll leave some time for conversation to talk about ways that maybe the strategies that you've tried are not working super well right now. And we can problem solve some specific points. Welcome, Elena. <laughs> All right. So, I thought I might tell you a little bit about why I'm here, and that will give you also a sense of what I might be able to offer to you by way of tactics and strategies. So, I am married to a serial entrepreneur um, who has started and sold several um, SaaS businesses. Uh, his name is Rob Walling. And so, for the last 
18 years I've been kind of on the periphery of the technology creative kind of community. And in addition to that though, I'm a, a clinical psychologist, so I have a PhD, and my area of expertise is in anxiety and stress. And so I started my career actually, <coughs> you're welcome. I started my career actually working with people who had been deployed to combat zones, so military veterans, and then I worked a lot with physicians in the ER, people who had very high intensity jobs. And so through the combination of my professional work and my family work, my being married to my husband, I found this sort of need or this awareness of folks who are creatives or technologists who are running their own business or who are kind of out there on their own trying to craft their version of a good life, but who are also experiencing fairly high levels of stress and anxiety and pressure that are somewhat unique to people in the technology sphere. So for the last several years, my focus of my work has been on how to really help support um, technologists, if you will, word pressers, in the kind of work that you all want to do, but also to support the well-being of your minds. And so I am a huge fan of entrepreneurship, of being a technologist, of starting your own business and figuring it out, of leaving your day job, or staying in your day job, either way, but really figuring out how to craft a life that works for you. But one of the things that's really core to our conversation about mental health is celebrating what's good, right? The sort of Instagram version of our lives where it's like, look, here I am in Belgrade having such a great time with all my WordPress friends. But we also have to tell the truth about what's very hard about this particular version of life that we've chosen. So this isn't an easy path when you bear the responsibility for your own livelihood, when you're using your brain, your ingenuity, your ability to code, your ability to design, your ability to see the world in a certain way or solve problems in a unique way, and that's the basis of your livelihood, that can be extra tricky, right? Your brain is the basis of how you make your money and how you survive. And with that comes some unique stressors. So some of the things that can make, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you work for someone else, many of us, actually let me ask you, how many of you work in a remote location, either from home or co-working space or, okay, that half of you. And how many of you go to an office with other people who have the same job-ish? All right, so we're about half and half. So that can bring with it a lot of isolation. <coughs> Anxiety, burnout, we'll talk a little bit about. The weight of keeping up with, I don't know, new rollouts in the latest iteration or version of WordPress can cause a lot of stress, failed relationships. Lots and lots of people are having difficulty sleeping, certainly, especially in the technology sector. Some of these are just life problems, but some of them I think are exacerbated by the kind of work that that you all are doing, that can make it more difficult to sleep, feel more isolated, feel more anxious about becoming obsolete, or being behind, or not being able to keep up with the latest trends, or the latest technology, the latest rollouts, the latest apps, the latest everything. <laughs> so there's a lot of instability in our work in technology. So lots of challenges that can when taken together, really contribute to this underlying constant anxiety that really can eat away at our mental health. And I think increasingly we're seeing this conversation come to the forefront of the technology space. And certainly because of the very talented entrepreneurs that we've recently lost, I think we're have to be honest about the fact that we have to have these kinds of conversations about mental health, about what it is that brings us meaning in our lives, what it is that helps us to stay around when we feel lost or lonely or desperate and 
really may have moments of feeling like we'd rather not be here anymore. None of this is simple, right? We don't lose beautiful, talented people simply because of depression. It's more complicated than that. And some of the things that now drive depression, anxiety, are things that live in our cultural water. They live in our shared consciousness, our cultural consciousness. It's not just an individual problem. It's not just one broken mind, which is why it's amazing to have this conversation in the community, because the way that you interact with others, the way that you build your community, whether it's WordPress or you know, your local community, has significant implications for what mental health looks like for members of that community, right? So we're not talking just about an individual problem, we're talking about a collective problem. So just to give you a little bit of data, um, the first slide is US stats, and then I have some EU stats for you too. So at least within the US, one in five adults experience mental illness in a given year. And mental illness is a huge category of things that includes the most common ones, depression and anxiety and substance abuse. So those are the three big ones. ADHD is also very common, as you probably know. And this affects a tremendous number of people. And only about 40% of folks receive mental health care. Mental health reasons, at least in the US, is the number one driver of disability. So the number one reason why people are no longer able to work or to contribute to the economy, to their communities, is, at least in the United States, is depression. So it's extremely costly, almost $200 billion lost in earnings per year. And it's, again, <coughs> these are very complicated kind of issues, and so we see that folks who struggle with Serious mental illness, long-term mental illness, die on average 25 years earlier than their sort of age-balanced cohort. So this is serious not only because people are sad, but because it, it ends people's lives. Not even just by suicide, but by over time, the lost level of health, the lost level of ability to contribute or ability to care for oneself. And we lose years of productive, meaningful time. In the EU, the stats are somewhat similar. It's about a quarter of the population, 27% of the population that experiences um, a, a mental disorder within a given year. And it's the third leading cause of disability in Europe. Six European countries fall within the top 20 countries in the highest, with the highest estimated suicide rates globally. So, you know, this is happening all over the world. Um, as you well know, I just, I'm sure why you're here. I'm, I'm telling you about a problem that you already know about, so I'm aware of that. I'm just making the case for why we have to take this super seriously. So we're losing some of our best and our brightest in their ability to contribute work-wise, in their ability to stick around and be part of, part of us, to be part of our communities, but also to contribute meaningfully to the world. And I think that's, you know, that's the heart of my mission, is to have this conversation in ways that we can help prevent bad things from happening. So I'd like to, talk not only about depression, anxiety, but some of the things that are super common in our workplaces, in our lives, like burnout. How many of you have heard the term burnout? Yes, okay. Um, sorry? Mine was huge. You had a huge burnout. So many, many people have huge burnout. About 30% of the adult workforce, both in the US and the UK, where they've done fairly large scale studies, report significant experiences of burnout. So what are we talking about when we talk about burnout? What does that word mean to you? Exhaustion, yes. Becoming completely unable to function at work and the various, various social relationships. Yes. So she said completely unable to function at work and in social relationships. What else comes to mind when you think about burnout? Yes. A feeling of complete overwhelm. 
Mm -hmm. Overwhelm, complete overwhelm. Other experiences or things that come to mind we think about right now. Yes, sir. Lack of ideas and interested. Interest. Yes. Mm. Lack of ideas and feeling interested in your work yes. anymore. Yes. It can get worse. Sorry. Sorry to drop in, but uh, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but here in Serbia, if you go to a mental health professional with the burnout, they're very, very quick to diagnose you with something far worse or far serious. <laughs> you don't care. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what happened to me, so I spent 18 months of, of grief. So she's identifying the fact that sometimes it's hard if you go to a mental health professional for them to correctly assess burnout as opposed to depression because they look very similar, but they are different. They have different causes and different treatments. So in many countries, the U.S. included, you have to be, unfortunately, you have to be pretty well informed and able to advocate for yourself and say, no, no, no. I think this is a burnout situation, and here's what burnout is. So you guys are right on in terms of the kinds of things that we look for when we see burnout. So burnout has historically not been a, a formal diagnosis, but recently uh, the World Health Organization did add it to the ICD-10, which is sort of the international list of all of the problems that you could have. So now it has a code, which means you can go to your doctor and say, no, I think I have burnout. It's a real thing. It has a code. As long as it has a code, it's a real thing. So burnout involves exhaustion, physical and emotional exhaustion. You wake up tired, even if you're sleeping well. You don't feel like you have any energy. There's this sense of like kind of numbness or flatness or boredom, like numb, not, not awake, not, no passion, no spark, no great ideas, fatigued, tired. And there's a sense of cynicism and detachment. So this mostly shows up in interpersonal relationships. So when you used to get super excited about a new customer or a new client, now you have really sarcastic, snarky things to say about that customer or that client or you're dismissive of your coworkers. You find that you just, you just don't care, and you don't care to be kind, you don't care to be patient, you, don't, you feel like your work is sort of meaningless anyway, what's it all for? You're kind of um, just, just not engaged, like your heart's not in it anymore. <coughs> and then finally, you have a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. And this is regardless of any external data that might say that actually you're doing quite well, you're doing great work, you're getting new clients. It is, it is irrational, it is detached from any data points that say you're doing a good job. You just don't feel like, you kind of feel like you're pushing a boulder up the hill all the time. It's very effortful. And you don't feel the satisfaction of like, done and done, I did a good job, but you never get that sense of uh, accomplishment. So this is, a very serious problem. Christina Maslach at UC Berkeley is the one who conceptualized burnout and has been researching it for the last 30 years. And we now have incredibly compelling data that burnout is extremely bad for our, of course, work productivity and our relationships, but also really bad for our brains. So burnout, this sense of detachment, exhaustion, has the power to change both the chemical structure, the, chemi the chemistry and the structure of our brain. So brains of people who are in burnout look very different than brains of people who are not in burnout. And one of the primary differences, I'm kind of a science nerd, I promise, I won't forget about the tactics, I promise. But one of the primary differences that we see, you might not be able to read that well from the back, but in burnout, our amygdala, which is this almond-shaped part of our brain that lives in the center part of our brain. This is a part of our brain that's responsible for negative emotion, especially stress and anxiety. So in burnout, the amygdala is overactive. It actually gets bigger, and it's like pumping more stress sort of hormones through our body. So we have an overactive amygdala, which is that subjective feeling of stress. But then, because the amygdala is overactive, in burnout we see 
the connections between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that helps us talk ourselves down when we feel stressed. And it also helps us plan. It's kind of this, you know, the rational, most human philosophical parts of our brain. The connections between those parts of the brain begin to fray. Literally, the, the myelin around the neurons starts to die. So we have an overactive anxiety response and an impaired ability to calm ourselves down. And this is happening at the cellular level. Like it's not like you can totally just think yourself out of it. And this cycle grows because of course, the more active the amygdala, the more damage we have in the connections between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. Just one second and I'll get to you. So when brains are in burnout for too long, the cells begin to die. We see changes in the way that the brain looks and that the brain functions, which is like a big, fat, red flag to wave at all of us and say, we have to take this seriously because we are changing what our brains look like. And there's possibility for the brain to repair to some extent but if we let this go on too long, then you know we've lost some of our cellular health. Yes, so question. I was wondering, because some research has proved that, for example, people with BPD have a different amygdala that's all working. Would we, would we then be more, more prone to stress than the other people and uh, more subjectable to burnout? Like more pro are we more likely to get a burnout? Bipolar disorder or borderline personality yeah, yeah. disorder? Borderline, borderline. I think any, any brain that's under stress, whether that's depression or borderline or too much caffeine, any brain that's I under stress, <laughs> any brain that's under stress is more fragile. So if we're not taking care of our stress, then we are in, at increased neurological risk for the kinds of consequences of burnout that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, borderline personality disorder is hereditary, it has been stigmatized by many media, but basically we are people who cannot regu regulate our emotions the way everybody else does. Dr. Marsh Marshall Inneton, who is the world's re re leading researcher on borderline personality disorder, she said that we are basically a mental equivalent of first degree burns. We have no emotional skin and everything hurts us and we feel more than everybody yeah. else and we, we can get easily overwhelmed. But unfortunately, the stereotypes about us are most, mostly based on characters like Alex from Fatal, At <coughs> Fatal Attraction, that it's not what we are like. She's a, she's a psychopath, actually. So and one and a range <laughs> of ways that the brain can be broken. So it shows up as one of the diagnoses in the, the catalog of codes. Uh, F60.3. <laughs> Very nice. I think the point here is that the most talented, smartest, capable among us, we are all vulnerable to being broken, to being hurt, to being stressed, to getting burnt out, to experiencing depression and anxiety. We see this over and over again that this isn't a problem of someone else. This is a problem of us, or if, if not us, then certainly someone who's right next to us, right alongside us. <coughs> so it's not something that we can ignore or minimize. So what do we do about it? What happens, actually let me go back here for a second. What happens in your body when you begin to experience stress? What do you notice happening in the moment when you're beginning to get stressed? Muscular tension. Uh-huh, muscular tension. Headache, heartbeat. Headaches, heartbeat, what happens to your heartbeat? Uh -huh. Accelerated heartbeat, rapid heartbeat, yes? Yeah, I have had like kind of two times one was like a numbness on the forehead, mm -hmm. and uh, I was trying like to meditate, for example, and I was like more focused on the numbness. Okay. And I kind of, I do have something not 
left part of my body, uh, near my heart, like scrambling, I don't know. <laughs> a, a sense of like tension, yeah, tightness. I, I, I spent a lot of money going to cardiologists and they said yes. your heart is like perfect. Your heart is great, but yeah. it doesn't feel great subjectively. That sort of muscle tension in your chest is very common, especially when people have a panic attack. That's why sometimes people feel like they're having a heart attack because okay. they're constricting in their heart muscle. Yeah, it's been, uh, after several days of this uh, stress, for example, migraine. Yes. Migraine headaches are commonly stressed. Shortness of breath. <coughs> yes. Shortness of breath. Yep. Other things you notice? Itching? Yep. Skin irritation. Yep. Skin irritation. You break out. Skin picking. You know, be with you to concentrate like your brain is uh, 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 not listening. Yep. So you can, sometimes people have, they chew their nails, they pick their skin, you have probably your own version of the repetitive thing that you do when you're feeling stressed out. I just wanted to say that I have all of this. <laughs> we all do. We all do. I mean, maybe, you know, slightly different, like, things from the menu, but we all do. Our bodies are super hardwired for this response, and it's a great response, actually. The stress response is super important. It's, it protects us. It can save our lives. Think about what happens when you are under threat. Your body has this amazing system where it diverts all of your blood flow to your arms and your legs. It goes away from your chest. It goes away from your digestion. And your body is like ready to fight or run or do something drastic to save your life. And your body is super efficient at this. Your heart goes faster. Your blood pumps harder. That's why your heart is going faster because it's moving blood in a more rapid rate. Your respiration increases and it goes into your chest. So you're getting the most air that you can between sort of the quickest intake right into your lungs. And this is so powerful, but as you all well know, when it is not an acute or an urgent situation, when it lingers too long, then we move from acute stress to chronic stress. And that same stress response that's designed to save our lives becomes something that's actually very dangerous and toxic to us. Because our bodies are designed to do that quickly and for a short period of time, and then resolve, go into relaxation mode. But most of us live with chronic stress. We live with things coming at us all the time. And so we live in an elevated level of stress, which over time breaks down our bodies, causing heart disease, muscular problems, some kinds of cancer, I mean, all kinds of chronic health problems are linked back to the stress response gone awry. So one of the most imperative things that we can do to manage our mental health is to help our body go into a relaxation response and move out of a stress response. Are you with me so far? Okay. So one way to do this, well, one thing that we're like learning a lot about right now, this is kind of newer science, is the vagus nerve. Who's heard of the vagus nerve? Mm -hmm. All right, you guys are advanced stress response students. <laughs> so the vagus nerve is a nerve that kind of is centered in the brain stem and goes all throughout your spinal cord and has contact points with all of your major organs. So it is the part of our bodies that's responsible for the calm down response, for shutting off the stress response. And one of the fastest ways to communicate to the vagus nerve is through deep, slow breaths. So if there's a way to kind of hack the system, to make our bodies move into a relaxation response and out of an anxiety response, out of a stress response. It's the most efficient, fastest acting way is through low, slow, deep breath. Because think about it, like you can't be in an anxiety response where your body is attuned to breathing fast and having this like sort of dramatic reaction. You, you can't do that and breathe in a really slow, calm way. So, how do you do this, you might ask? 
I know many of you have practiced meditation and so, or yoga or things like that, so this might feel a little elementary, but let's start with the baby steps and we can add more complexity or specialization as we go. So I know it's a little warm in here, but um, we are gonna practice breathing. If you fall asleep, it's okay, <laughs> we'll understand. Um, we have to move out of that tight, fast, rapid breath and move lower in the body. So I'm gonna walk you through how to do this from a couple frameworks and we'll, we'll give it a try. So to start, a couple, so I'm gonna make recommendations. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna just sort of teach it to you. You can do or not do what feels right to you. So we have an invitation to close your eyes if you wish. If that doesn't feel comfortable to you, don't do it, it's fine. Um, another invitation is to put your feet flat on the ground and really lean back into your chair. So kind of resettle yourself, move things around. Close your eyes if you wish. Just take a moment to notice the chair underneath you. Notice how the chair is supporting your body. Notice how the floor is supporting your feet. Notice that you can release your body into the chair. You don't have to hold yourself up. You don't have to hold your breath. You can kind of flop into the chair underneath you if you wish. Place one hand over your belly button. And see if as you inhale, take air into your body, see if you can get your belly button to move, to expand. You can even imagine that there's a balloon in your belly and as you inhale, the balloon expands and as you exhale, your belly button pulls toward your spine and the balloon deflates. So just play with moving your breath down to your belly. And use your hand as a guide. You can even look down at your hand and see if it's moving as you breathe. So the challenge is to pull your breath low in your body. And the second challenge is to slow your breath down. You can imagine hitting a slow motion button on your body. Breathing in for four counts. Breathing out for four counts. You can try it with me if you wish. So inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. If you find that your mind is wondering a little bit, give it something to do. Perhaps imagine the path that your breath travels. Maybe you imagine bright blue oxygen entering your nose and going down through your throat, down through the center of your body, filling your lungs, your diaphragm, the center of your body with nourishing, life-giving oxygen. And perhaps imagine that carbon dioxide 
leaving your body, going from the cavity in your belly up through your core, up through your chest, out your nose. So give your brain something to do as you think about your breath. Count your breath. Imagine your breath. okay for your breath to make a little bit of sound. a couple more in your own timing. And release your hand from your belly when you're ready. when you're ready. Maybe you wiggle your fingers and toes to kind of wake you up a little bit. All right, how are you feeling after a couple of deep breaths? <coughs> Anybody ready for a nap? Yeah. <laughs> what worked? well about that exercise for you. And I'll ask you also what didn't work. So first let's start with what, what worked well. What helped or didn't or Yes. Yeah. So when I'm like uh, completely focused on the breath, mm -hmm. it feels pretty good. Like you are, uh, I don't know, kind of your mind is out of the body. So the body is complete relaxed and not having any no any kind of pain or or tension or things like that. What it doesn't work is always I mean I'm trying with some apps like calm and things yeah. like that. And what it doesn't work is that when I'm having any physical pain or any stress related physical response like uh, numbness uh, when I can't completely focus, my mind goes and focus on the numbness, for example, which comes and to be more, uh, m more like, more, uh, I, like I feel it more, and it doesn't let me meditate. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of people can probably relate, like, this works well when you take a couple breaths, but it's also very easy to get distracted. How many of you feel sometimes distracted by either something in your body or something in your mind? Yeah, everybody gets a little distracted about it. I think I'm the only person who didn't manage this. I'm like, oh, shiny, twitch, twitch, twitch. That's okay. So this kind of, let me, let me organize my thoughts here. This kind of practice, is not the only way to calm down, and it's not ideal for everyone. There are those of us among us, myself included to some extent, who calm down best in motion. So stillness is not optimal for everyone. You can breathe well while you're walking. You can breathe well while you're moving. You can breathe well while you're dancing. You, you don't have to sort of sit still and go only internal. That's not the only strategy. However, sometimes, if you're like me, before a meeting or a conference presentation or something, you just need like a quick, a quick reset. And you don't have time to go for a walk and you don't have time to you know, do your yoga moves. So you need something quick. And that's where this kind of practice is helpful. 
So four breaths in, four seconds in, four seconds out, can be enough to, in the moment, just sort of reset you real quick. But for things that are more complicated, and all of our lives are more complicated, so this is, again, kind of the entry point. You're, you've noticed that stress response beginning, and you want a quick tactic to counteract it. Four breaths, four seconds in, four seconds out. That's sort of one of our best scientifically proven strategies to, in the moment, do a quick turnaround, a quick calm down, I should say. But of course, it's gonna break down. So if this isn't something that works for you regularly, if this isn't your optimal, regular calm down strategy, then we have to get more creative. We have to think of moving exercises or other things that help you breathe, circulate oxygen extensively throughout your body that, that work. Yes? <clears throat> I appreciate that. I don't know if you could hear him in the back, but he was reflecting on the importance of not having high expectations. And I think a lot of people will say to me, I could never meditate. Like, I can't sit still that long, or who has a half an hour to sort of, you know, sit and, and have deeper consciousness. But four breaths, five minutes, these little tiny interventions can make a big difference. So, um, invitation, let's stand up. If you don't want to, that's fine, but the invitation is to stand up. And let's try a little bit of a moving breath. Also, I don't, you know, I think we're getting t tired and hot, so. <laughs> so let's just play a little bit with breath in motion. So we're gonna pair an inhale and an exhale with a specific movement. So let's start first with an inhale where we Bring our arms up to the ceiling, reach up high, and exhale, flat down. And if you accidentally hit your friend, that's okay. That's how you make friends. Inhale, reach up high. You can look up and exhale, come down. Let's do that one more time. Big breath in. Big breath out. Let's roll our wrists. Think about your breath. And let that go. Inhale your shoulders up to your ears. And exhale, shoulders back and down. This is to counteract laptop. Inhale, shoulders up, and exhale, shoulders back and down. And close your eyes if you wish. Inhale up, exhale down. Inhale, give yourself a hug. Pull your shoulder blades slightly forward. And exhale, arms open to the world. Inhale, give yourself a hug. Pull those shoulder blades apart, open the back. And exhale, open up. One more time. And exhale. Let's do a little ballet. Inhale, arms and toes up. 
Exhale, if you have room, you can fold forward or just make a ball with yourself, your choice. So inhale, up tall, reach up. And exhale, make a little ball. Try closing your eyes here. You might hit someone, it's okay. Try not to fall over, I don't know if we have insurance for that. Listen for your own breath. And relax. Put your feet shoulder width apart so that there's a little space between your feet. Stand up as tall as you can like you're a little kid who's trying to get on a roller coaster, but you're like a little too short. So you're trying to be as tall as you can be. Roll your shoulders back. Maybe face your palms toward me. Close your eyes for a second. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Deep breath in, deep breath out. <laughs> Open your eyes, shake it out a little bit, do a little dance. All right, have a seat. <laughs> Does anyone feel a little more awake? <coughs> <laughs> a little sweaty, <laughs> a little more relaxed. <laughs> uh, make a video or something. So th what we did was really quite simple. Okay, when you think about what happens in your body when you're working on a computer all the time, most of us are a little hunched over, right? So most of us have pain here. And so just think about movements that counteract that. Anytime you're kind of opening your chest and putting your shoulders back. A lot of us also have a lot of tension here in our forearms from this action. So thinking about how things with your wrists, pushing your hands together, inverting that. If you, I'm gonna put in a little plug here. So a lot of this movement stuff comes for me, from my psychological training, but also from yoga practice. And yoga is one of the tools that has been sort of clinically proven to help reduce the effects of anxiety and depression. And is, especially for those of us who have a fairly sedentary lifestyle, who sit a lot, is an incredibly helpful way to deal with both the mental health and physical health challenges of many of our jobs. So that's a lot of what we did. This, this movement, just standing like this, this is called mountain pose. This is a, a yoga move, but it's really just opening your chest, standing at your full height. So even taking moments in your day to practice that kind of expansion and like feeling solid in your body can be really helpful. Bye. Okay. So the body is one part of this. And we've talked about breath, we've talked a little bit about you know, the importance of integrating your body into your well-being. Would anybody like to experience better memory, better concentration, less motivation to eat a lot, have a better mood? have a stronger immune system, make fewer mistakes. I have an Amazon store set up for <laughs> Just kidding. This is free. What is this? What is, uh, what is if only one or two of these problems remain? For example, I only have the first two in the second column. Um, no, well, these are not only problems. These are the benefits of... I mean... Uh, 
Don't sleep. Problems. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that. So if yeah. if you have some challenge with memory and concentration, basically everything is all shiny. All shiny. Very yes. Very lovely, lovely. So many shiny things in the world. Yeah. Yeah. One of. An ENFP thing. <laughs> yes. One of the ways to enhance the functioning of your brain, enhance your mental health, is to really make sure that you're taking care of your body by sleeping well. I know you may not have come all the way to Belgrade for me to tell you you need to get some sleep. <laughs> but it might be the most important thing you hear. Many of us do not sleep enough. And when we talk about things that <coughs> make it easy to feel stressed, anxious, depressed, burnt out, irritable, unhappy with our lives. One of those risk factors is having a, a compromised brain, a brain that's not functioning well. And there is no way for our brain to function well if we don't sleep well. Our brain is incredibly active during sleep. It's when we integrate memory. It's when we process the work of the day. And if we don't sleep enough, um, all kinds of bad things happen. So if you're serious about mental health, and you're like, wow, why do I feel so miserable all the time? And you're not sleeping well, this is, a, this is probably the first area of intervention. So when people come into my office and they're like, well, Dr. Walling, like, I'm, really, I'm not feeling well, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time, I ask this question immediately. How are you sleeping? because it's one of the most powerful indicators that we're doing well or not doing well is, is how well we're sleeping. Yes? Uh, I'm wondering when you have a depressive episode, you usually sleep maybe too much, so what to do about that? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we talk about um, dysregulation or feeling off, feeling depressed, um, it's either hypersomnia or insomnia, so sleeping too much or sleeping too little. Sleep is one of the first things to get disrupted when we're having a depressive episode or an, a season of anxiety or when we're in burnout. So, to some extent, if you feel like you're sleeping too much, or, I mean, some people really, they're in a depressive episode, will, will be in bed 20 hours a day. So it's, it can be quite debilitating. That's a place where, um, it makes it very hard to function normally when you are sleeping that much. And I think there are a couple things I would think about. Um, if you feel like you're sleeping too much, it's actually rarely a problem among technology folks, but if you feel like that's happening, to think about what's the optimal sleep for you and then try to like hack the system, so to speak, like make yourself wake up, use bright lights, use being in motion. Um, on the other hand, sometimes it's okay for a couple days to just call it an and stay in bed. It depends on the situation. It depends on who you are and what's good for you. It depends on what you need to maintain your particular level of well-being. So I don't want to sort of stand up here and say, like, well, if you're sleeping more than 10 hours, then you really got to get up and exercise, because that's not the answer for everyone. The answer for everyone is knowing your own self and your own body and knowing what you need when you start to move into depression or when you start to move into anxiety is figuring out what works for you and having a plan for that for yourself. So there's a, there's a non-answer to your question. Yes? In my case, uh, like more than sleeping, um, I, I don't have any problems falling asleep because I, I get by the end of the day very tired. Um, but during the night, I wake up several times without wanting to, and, and so even if I only have slept seven and a half hours or ten, yeah, this, this way you're not well hours, rested. I'm already feeling tired the whole day. I, I can't uh, mm -hmm. be rested anymore. Uh, for example, my, my girlfriend, she wakes up several times during the night as well, mm -hmm. but for her, it's normal and she doesn't feel uh, exhausted after, after that. Yes. So sleep is nuanced. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night, 
if you wake up and you prevent, your mind is prevented from entering a REM cycle of sleep, that's our sort of deepest sleep cycle when our brain is most active. If your brain isn't entering REM sleep in a certain cyclical pattern, then it will be very difficult for you to feel rested. So waking up at the wrong time can absolutely disrupt your sleep for a long time. So when you, if you find that you're having sleeping difficulties, either difficulty falling asleep or difficulty um, with waking up in the middle of the night, what are some strategies that have worked for people? I have a list, but I'm, I think you all have some in your lives too. What helps you sleep well? Do exercises? Sorry? Yes, be very active, but not two hours before you go to bed. So earlier in the day. Yes? Um, like, for me, it really helps to have like a nighttime routine. So an hour before I go to sleep, like typically I would work until the last minute and then try to go to sleep and I'm yeah. my awake because my mind would be in my bed. So an hour before I went to go to sleep, I just, you know, wash face and I do my things and I read a bit and have tea or whatever. And that really helps like that conscious work Absolutely. So having a really set nighttime routine where you're winding down and an important piece of that is turning your screens off, not not looking at screens like the hour before you go to sleep. Yes. He said two really important things, and just for those of you who maybe didn't hear in the back, the first thing that he mentioned was the importance of not stressing out about sleep. So if you're finding that you're awake after you want to be, many of us get in a little pattern in our minds where we're like, I really gotta go to sleep, I really gotta go to sleep, I really gotta go to sleep, which of course makes it really difficult to sleep when you're stressed out. So to just say, all right, well, I'm having a night where I'm not sleeping a lot, I might need to make some adjustments in my day, and that's what it will be. And then the second uh, thing that you mentioned is that everyone has their own sleep needs. So you might be, your optimal <coughs> hours might be seven, might be eight, but some people need 10 or 11 hours of sleep, and that's, that's the way that your body is working, and there's not much to be done about that. Yes? For example, if you have a PCOC, um, PCOS, sorry. And, uh, Maybe say what the acronyms poly are. Polycystic ovary syndrome, and uh, you get insulin resistance, and you often get uh, side effects such as uh, PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Then you simply get that uh, spells of sleep that can last like up to 14 hours, mm -hmm. and there is not, mu not much you can do about that because you feel like the truck has run you over. Yes, our need for sleep can go up and down. That this happens between the ovulation and the cycle a couple of times, and I'm trying not to not to consider myself free because of that. I think when your body needs sleep, the most compassionate thing you can do is just let your body sleep. Mm -hmm. Like, is it not something to fight? Right. Other sleep comments? Yes. That's a pretty basic thing, but for me, it's bad to sleep in complete darkness. Yes. So in a very dark room, that the other recommendation is a, is a cold room, a room that's sort of cold and then you have like a cozy blanket. Some people like a weighted blanket. They like to feel a little bit of pressure from their bed, you know, their bed clothes and that 
can help you to feel sort of calm. There's a calming response there. Uh, yes, go ahead. Sorry. No? Uh, I guess you could write things down before you go to sleep. Yes. Because a lot of times we have a lot of things going on. Yeah? And uh, I usually, I, if I don't write things down, and it's something important that th I'm thinking about, uh, by the time morning comes, I forget about it. It's crazy. It was, it was really important and, and uh, interesting, and in the morning I wake up totally, it's gone. So keep a little notebook by your bed. Yeah, yeah, sort of a journal. Uh, yes. Yeah. Especially the things that you want to do tomorrow, so that you're not like, I have to remember this, yeah. I have to remember this. Yeah. Yes. I don't have my trouble sleeping. I sleep well. I have trouble going to sleep. Mm -hmm. But I found out like a three useful techniques. One of them listening with headphones, some stories, whatever it is, like on someone talking, yeah. even in strange language. Uh, the second technique was reading a book before reading something before mm -hmm. or while you're in bed. And the third one, which is like when I want to put my daughter to sleep, I fall asleep before her. <laughs> <laughs> Have your daughter put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us I think so I I wanted to say that uh, having a kid really helps you uh, appreciate uh, <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you children. <laughs> Thank you. Children. <laughs> I think one of the tendencies that some of us have is to uh, pull our laptops into bed with us <laughs> or like no. either start the day with our laptop in bed or like just, oh, I just need to do one more thing before bed. And that's a, that's a big no-no. <laughs> so if you want to optimize sleep, your bed is for sleep, maybe a little reading, <coughs> and for sex. That's what happens there. No email, no Twitter, no Slack. None of that should be in your bed. Like, let your bed be the sleep intimacy zone, not, not any, and some reading. But yeah, so like not having a TV in your room, really not doing anything in your bed except for those kinds of things can be a helpful, it's like contextual cue that tells your brain like, okay, we do these activities in this space and these activities in this space, which can prime your brain to do those activities in the right time and place. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, one, one of the things I have on my to list to improve my, my bedroom uh, experience uh -huh. to buy an alarm clock, the old ones mm -hmm. that are just a clock with an alarm. Not your phone. To leave my phone out of the bedroom. Yes. So after X time, I just don't use it the phone anymore. Yeah. I am a big fan of no screens in the bedroom at all. No phones. Okay, I'm going to skip some of this. Um, let's just, we talked a little bit about body. That's another sort of tech related problem that is pretty significant is if you are sitting most of your day and not taking time to move around, you put yourself at risk for all kinds of physical and health problems. And the the minimum viable effort to counteract that is 30 minutes of movement three times a week. You don't have to run marathons, you don't have to do CrossFit, you don't have to be, just one second, you don't have to be fancy in the way that you go about this. You just need an elevated heart rate, some, some little gentle beads of sweat, and you're moving your body three times, 30 minutes at minimum. That's kind of the research-based minimum standard to counteract all of the, the bad things that can happen when you have an overly sedentary existence. Is yes? Is you kilometers on the bike per week too much? Is, is what? Is 100 kilometers on the bike per week, like three times per something too much? Am I overdoing it? Uh, you have to check with your doctor. <laughs> but everybody has a different body in the sense like of like the what... Restless and the yeah. need to let it all out. Yeah, and if you, you sort of experiment with what works best for you in terms of noticing how you feel when you are exercising a certain level and you make adjustments. So I think we can all use a little bit of scientific method with our own mental health. So you, you do an experiment. What, what does it feel like if I run at this time of day 
for five miles or uh, five kilometers. How does that feel in my body? Right. And then I make an adjustment, and then I try something else. It's, a, it's an evolving, highly individualized process. So, you know, when you see online, like, this is, the, this is the magic bullet. This is the morning strategy that will optimize your productivity. Some of that is really not helpful because your body works in a different way than every other body. And it's your responsibility as someone who is committed to optimizing both your mental health and your ability to contribute in a meaningful way to the work that you find important. It's your job to figure out, to be the expert about yourself about how your body works, how your mind works. So it's amazing to utilize resources, listen to people like me, to you know, read things online, but at the end of the day, you are the one who is responsible for doing what you can to sort of prevent problems from happening by optimizing how you take care of your body in the way that your body needs. It's highly individualized, right? All right. Um, and of course, this is necessary because when we work against ourselves, we always lose. Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's a journey. Right? Yeah. It's your personal journey that you have to find your way. Right. Yeah. All right. So one other sort of set I wanted to talk about a little bit is to think about not. So we talked about mental health broadly. We've talked about the relationship between mental health and the body, where we think about breath, where we think about sleep, where we think about nutrition. Let's talk a little bit about the content of our minds. Okay. Or let me give you a let me give you a choice. We'll do this by democratic vote. <laughs> no. So we can talk about kind of thought process and ways to challenge how we're thinking, the content that happens in our minds, or we can do some more movement or breathing. Do you have opinions? Content. Who would like me to talk to you more? <laughs> okay. Who would like to move around or breathe? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Captive audience. If you want to move around or breathe, just go in the corner and move around and breathe. <laughs> that will be fine. <laughs> okay. So when we think of okay, let's let me just be honest. We're all a little bit crazy. Okay, can we just agree on that? I say that in the most loving and professional way possible. Yes, you're a little bit crazy. Thank it's okay. You. We all we all feel like imposter syndrome. We all have self doubt. We all have nutty ideas sometimes. We all get anxious. We're all irrational or sometimes too rational in a way that like crosses over into being irrational. We all can be a little bit anal retentive. Like we all get kind of broken in our minds. And I think um, one of the best strategies that we can use when we're talking about the conversation in here is to really accept that there's a certain level of craziness that's just part of how we're made. It's cool. But also think about how to have a good relationship with the cast of characters that lives in our minds. So, I know this one. you know this one? Yeah. I love this girl, anxiety girl, able to jump to the worst conclusion in a single bound. <laughs> oh, good grief. These tights are too tight. I think I'm going to die. <laughs> when we are able to take a little bit of a step back and think about how we are thinking, metacognition, think about our own thinking, we have a little bit more power over the kind of story that we're telling ourselves in our mind. So I, and I think, you know, when we're doing cool stuff in the world, there's high highs and low lows. Like we can be all over the place, right? So I had this experience 
a couple of months ago, um, I finished a book, which I was super excited about, and I emailed Seth Godin and said, would you write an endorsement for my book? And I was like, there's no way he is going, like, it's Seth Godin. And he wrote back in like three minutes, he was like, absolutely, send it to me. I was like, really? So I was writing high, I was super excited. I finished a book, that's so cool. Seth Godin was gonna, he wrote a little thing, it's on the back of the book, it's so cool. And then we came to book launch day. And so my husband and I emailed our email list and between the two of us, mostly him, not me, but we sent out an email to 20,000 people all about our book and we're like, this is amazing. And in the email was like the link to the book was broken. And in like two seconds, I was like, I am terrible at this. I'm never writing another book. I'm never doing anything in public. No one's gonna read this book from someone who can't write an email. I'm clearly incompetent and I should just quit it all. It sounds like my mom. Has that happened to you guys? <laughs> so we all have a little crazy, right? And we can be super excited one moment and the next moment we're like questioning our contribution to humanity and whether, <laughs> you know, like whether we should just like go in the back somewhere and hide. That is really normal, I think, I hope. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but how do we do that well? Like, how do we have a good relationship with like the ups and downs and then the self-criticism and the excitement and all of the swirl of all of it? And I will tell you one of the most powerful ways to do that, wait for it, is to keep a journal. To have a mechanism by which you are getting some of this material out in front of you in a way where you're separating the material, the content, the voices in your head from where you can look at it objectively. You can take it out of your mind. So for people who really have a lot of swirling voices, a lot of swirling anxiety, a lot of thoughts that go round and around and go really fast, we um, you know, often have them Keep a journal. Sometimes you even name the voices. Like, a lot of us have a really critical voice, the criticizer, the one who's like, oh, that design is crap. You, I can't believe you're gonna show that to your client. Or, I can't believe that you think your, your ideas are valid or interesting. Does anybody have a voice like that? Yeah. Just, just me. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you can name it your mother if that's where it came from, or you can just name it like, critical jerk, or give it, give it a name, because that gives it less power. Give it an avatar. What does your critical voice look like? Yeah. Is it like green with a pointy nose and crazy hair and bad teeth? Or is it like big and blobby and purple and kind of slimy? I'm being playful, but I'm also dead serious. Seven. When seven is beautiful, green eyes, red hair, sort of a witch. Sort of a witch, yeah? yeah. Some of us have a witch that lives in our head. The, the, the mean kind, not the nice kind. So you might also think about the voice in your head that is your encourager voice. So you have probably a critical voice. You might have an encourager voice. A voice that's like, I think it's gonna be okay. You can do it. Just keep trying. You can learn this. And maybe it. maybe that's your mom or your dad or your somebody else. Yes. Is there an app for that? No, there's I don't think an app for that. Boom, thank you for the idea. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to make a voices in your head avatar app, that would be amazing, and I will send you lots of clients. <laughs> but <laughs> We all, it's on video, we all agree on this today. <laughs> but when our voices are loud, and when that critical voice is the only voice that you're listening to, it's too powerful. And when we give it a silly face, when we give it a name, when we also acknowledge that there are multiple voices in our mind, and we don't have to just listen to one, Sometimes we can actively choose, like, okay, that's enough criticism for a while. Where's my encourager? Is it in there somewhere? I need to find my encourager voice. 
or my comforting voice, or the voice of the people that love me. I need to listen for something else. We do have some power to kind of change the channel on our thoughts, but only when we've done the work to notice how our thoughts are functioning, to notice the voices of our thoughts. So get out a piece of paper, you don't have to do this now, but this can be a, a, a take home homework assignment. <coughs> get out a piece of paper and give names to some of the different tracks that play in your head and give them avatars or give them an appearance. And one of your mindfulness practices I think we have time. So first of all, who is with me, like, who thinks I'm a kooky lady who's talking about those voices and weird monsters thing? Or, like, are you following me to understand yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Okay. Just the flying or freak flags along with you. Thank you, let's all, let's all fly our flag together. Sometimes, I don't know how to identify. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. What are the names of people? So for example, yes, the anxiety voice or the... Yes. There are certainly common voices. So, um, yes and no. So most of us have a, a critical voice that's basically like whatever you're doing is dumb. Most of us have an imposter voice, which is like the you don't belong here voice. Most of us, hopefully, if we've been loved reasonably well, have an encourager voice, a voice that says like, get out there, kid, try again. What other voices do you notice? Maybe a nag voice. The, a nagging voice, maybe? Who this? Who this an intellectual know? voice. I have an intellectual voice, a voice that's like, Let's just think our way through this problem. You might have a, a, a very feeling voice. Skeptical. A skeptical voice. I think, I don't know that science has done a lot of work on this, but I think that many of us construct these versions of our, our own mind is constructed through both our biology and the set of experiences that we've had. So if we've had a kind of childhood or early life experience where there was a lot of criticism, we might have a very strong critical voice. If we were someone who was loved well, we might have a stronger encouraged voice. So you have to kind of think about what voices, literal voices, you heard while you were developing, while you were becoming who you are, what sounds, what messages did you hear over and over, what shaped you. And that's a good place to start. Yes? But can you mention the journal before? What is the best way to keep it still using the classical way with a pencil and a, and a notebook or a... Oh, no. <laughs> the, the best way to keep it is the way that works for you, the way that you will do. So there is some research that shows that the relationship between handwriting is more emotionally nuanced, largely because most of us write more slowly than we type. So the, I would say that the gold standard would be a handwritten journal with a sort of you know special bound journal. But if that's not going to work for you, then use an app on your phone. By all means, use what works. It is thinking a voice? I think so. Intellectualizing might be a voice. Yeah. Okay. Um, you in the red, you had your hand up a second ago. No, I just wanted to add another voice, like a little scared kid. Voice. Yes. Yes. Okay. An immature voice, and then maybe a wise voice. Mm. So when you, I see you, I'll come back to you in just a second. Okay, I know, you have so many great things to say. <laughs> let, me, let me finish this thought and then we'll come back. So just to kind of close out the conversation about voices, it's one mechanism by which we can have some objectivity between what happens in our mind, make it a little less powerful, a little more playful, a little less controllable. So naming your cast of characters that lives inside of your head. If this, is, if this idea is really interesting to you, I'm pulling a little bit from a, something called internal family <coughs> systems. 
So I can give you that link or you can Google it. Internal family systems is sort of the psychological framework that talks about the, the voices in our head. The practice of journaling is a way of <coughs> noticing your highs and lows, noticing your feelings. You don't need to journal like, dear diary, today I had eggs for breakfast, followed by a good cup of coffee. <coughs> what you're going for when you're keeping a journal is keeping a record of where you came alive, where you felt like this is the moment that I want to live in, and also where you felt like I never want to have this experience again. So highs and lows. It can be a two-sentence journal. Today my high was, today my low was. That's one of the kind of most powerful data points that you can track over time. So I've been doing that journaling practice for like five years, and I have a friend and we talk on the phone every Sunday night, and I say, what was your high for the week? And what was your low for the week? And, and we, we are tracking together the highs and lows of our life so that when we come to a decision point, do we have another child? Do I change jobs? Do I go on this trip? You have all of this record that you can look back on and, and look and see, actually, over the course of the last few years, some of my most significant highs happened when I was traveling or happened when I was doing this. So when I come to a decision point, I'm going to look at my own data based on my own life because I'm listening to what I am experiencing in my life and letting that shape me. So a journal is a powerful thing because it can get your thoughts away from you, but also be a, a data record. And by thoughts away, I mean thoughts objective, not so powerful and loud and strong in our own minds. Okay, so we have just five minutes left, and I'm gonna hang out, out in the, that little sort of public foyer area after the workshop. If you have more questions for a couple minutes, I can chat. I'm also, um, I have a podcast where I talk about a lot of these issues. It's called Zen Founder. <coughs> it's free every week. Um, and I co-host it with my husband, so we really try to talk about the combination of psychology and technology and how those two interface. We also talk quite a bit about family and wellness and life. So we try to put that out as a resource. Um, there's an organization called Open Sourcing Mental Illness that's committed to having conversations about mental health and technology. And then as another resource, not because I'm trying to promote my stuff, but because it's the only resource that I know that's attempting to be a a mental health guide for people in technology. Um, the book that I wrote with my husband is called The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Ship Together, um, <laughs> How to Run Your Business Without Letting It Run You. And we talk about a lot of this material that we talked about today. So there are resources that are available, and I think the fact that you're here, the fact that this year at WordCamp EU there are three or four topics or talks that are talking about mental or physical health, that we're in the right place, having the right conversation about how to really preserve our well-being so that we can do the work that we want to do in WordPress. The last thing that I want to end on is that um, in my work in trauma and stress, the thing that consistently research shows to be the most important protective factor. So when you are under stress, when you're vulnerable in some way, there are things that increase your risk for problems and there are things that decrease your risk. The things that decrease your risk for mental health problems are called protective factors, right? They protect you. The most important protective factor for stress and anxiety and burnout actually is strong relationships. Having, you don't have to have like lots of friends, you don't have to be a social butterfly, but you have to have three or four people who love you and who you love and who will show up for you, who will listen to you when you're upset, who will encourage you when you're sad, who will help you sort out that cast of characters in your own mind. So the fact that you're here in a community 
with other people who care about and are interested in some of the same things that you are is already a great beginning point. And I love coming to WordCamps and WordPress events because of that deep value of we do this together. And the same is true about changing the conversation about mental health, about supporting each other as we have to do this together. So if nothing else that you take from this whole WordCamp experience, I hope that you will take the importance of having a couple relationships, maybe you make some new relationships while you're here, of sleeping well, <laughs> and of, of just making sure that you're taking very good care of yourself in whatever that looks like for you. Okay. So thanks for your attention. I think we might have, are we done? Two, three minutes, two, three minutes. Okay, so we have time for probably a couple of quick questions and then I'll be hanging out and I can chat throughout the day. Yes? How much coffee is enough? <laughs> <laughs> Again, you have your own body. But I will say that I talked, I have, I talked to many folks who are like, Wow, doctor, I'm like really feeling a lot of anxiety. My heart is racing. I'm feeling really tense. But I, you know, there's not any big stressor in my life. I don't know why I feel so much anxiety. And I'm like, how much coffee do you drink? I'm great. I'm not you, but like, great if, job. if you're drinking six or seven cups of coffee, I think that's probably, especially if you're drinking like American-sized cups of coffee, where oh, it's wow. like the big gulp, oh, wow. that's probably too much. So, um. I don't know that there's a gold standard, but probably like two or three is. Uh, I seven, eight per day. I think you're really gonna have a lot of anxiety feelings if you're um, drinking that much coffee. Okay. <laughs> also, I, I recommend like uh, after, for example, 4 p.m. No. Don't take more coffee. Really? And no. how do you do that? Like like the amount. Yeah, I'm like kidding. Uh, I, I, I just I'm saying, started Trying the cat. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you're you're <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Yes. Oh, that's too much. <laughs> so, anytime that you are using caffeine, marijuana, alcohol, whatever, to regulate your body's systems, I would say that's probably not the best. So using those things recreationally or whatever, but when it's like, I need this to function, especially high levels of caffeine, your, your body is going to feel anxious because that's what caffeine does. It's a stimulant. So. So we'll I found the problem. Same with salt, same with sugar. Yes. And these things you can, you can get used to get a lot and need that, but you can also get used to get and reduce it and not and get rid of it. Yeah. It's, a drug. it's all about taking good care of what you what you have. Your most in, important asset is you. So take care of those minds, take care of those bodies, and go have a great work camp. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.